Hey everybody, I am Brady Briggs. Welcome to another episode of the Combat Logic. Today I want to talk about UFC 272 as well as UFC Vegas 50. Um, see what's next for some of the biggest winners on the card. No, first I want to start off with Dustin Jacoby. No, this dude has had such a remarkable career resurgence um, since taking a break from MMA. So he first came to the UFC when he was just six and zero. He lost two straight fights and was cut. <clears throat> he then went four and three over his next seven before taking a break to uh, fight for glory as a professional kickboxer. He went 10 and eight as a pro kickboxer, but he fought some of the very best in the entire world. Like he fought Alex Perheya, for instance, before he even had 10 pro kickboxing fights. Um, he's got a win over Wayne Barrett. He fought Simon Marcus. He fought some of the very best in the entire sport. And it shows because his kickboxing is wicked now. And since returning to MMA, <clears throat> he's gone seven, zero and one which is pretty remarkable. That's 5-0-1 inside the UFC since returning. And he just beat Michelle Oleksiejczyk pretty handily. Almost knocked him off, too. And Oleksiejczyk is one of the more dangerous strikers in the sport. I really can't wait to see what's next for Jacoby, man. He's he's 33 years old, and he's better than ever. Ludovic Klein and Devonnie Smith had a good fight. It was... It got closer in the third round. You know, Devonnie was really putting it on him. But he got picked apart handily the first two rounds. He just didn't look comfortable in there at all. Um, but it's good to see Klein come back from a two-fight losing streak. Now Smith is on a two-fight losing streak. Um, I'm excited to see both of them back. Tim Elliott had a really, really good performance, too, in the first two rounds anyways. Beating Tagir Ulan back off is a multiple-time champion outside of the UFC. Yeah, Elliot just looked better than ever, man. He's really starting to put it together at 35 years old. Again, which is weird because he's had spurts of greatness. And then, I don't know, he's had motivation lapses maybe. He's lost some really close decisions. Um, for instance, Askar Askarov, who's pretty much the number one contender at Flyweight, he had a really close fight with that he could have gone the knot in. Um, his last uh, loss against Matthias Nikolov, another fight he could have easily gotten a nod in. Um, other than that, he's three and one in his last four. He could be four and zero oh in his last four, um, and it's really exciting to see. Umar Nurmagomedov, he is every bit as good as we thought he was. He submitted Brian Kelleher um, a little past the midway point of the first round, and Kelleher looked good in this fight too. Um, but no, Nurmagomedov is just way better. And there's something to be said about Kelleher. That dude will fight anywhere, or that dude will fight anybody on any given night. There's something to be respected about that. Nikola and Negaramanu and Kennedy and Juku, that was a good fight. Um, I think that Kennedy learned his lesson on eye pokes. Um, he may be more careful because he lost a split decision in that fight. And the only reason he lost that decision is because he had a point taken from four repeated eye pokes. Um, hopefully he can tighten that up because he's a really, really promising talent. Jalen Turner, another very, very promising talent, knocked out Jamie Malarkey in early in the second round, which was just remarkable because Jamie Malarkey fought guys like Ferris ZM, like Brad Rydell, a 58 or 59 and eight pro kickboxer, didn't get finished by him. Turner does it handily. Now Turner's on a four fight win streak, all four wins by finish, two knockouts, two submissions. Really can't wait to see what's next for him because with his frame and his striking technique, he's only 26 years old too. He's going to get so much better for the next four or five years. He may wear a belt in the UFC by the time his career is said and done. <clears throat> really can't wait to see what's next for him. Sergey Spivak beat the shit out of Greg Hardy, which I'm sure a lot of people were really happy to see. Hardy is now 0-3 in his last three, getting knocked out in all three of them. He's since been released by the UFC. And he has since said that he's not done. So I wonder who he's going to sign with next. That should be very interesting. Kevin Holland made his welterweight debut against Alex Oliveira, who, though, was on a three-fight losing streak, is a very technical, very dangerous fighter for a lot of opponents. 
And he was picking Holland apart pretty handily in that first round. He was actually completely all class Holland in that first round. Um, <clears throat> and Holland came back in the second round and knocked him out early in it, 38 seconds into it. Um, that was really cool to see. I really can't wait to see what's next for Kevin Holland because he's finally in his weight class that he belongs in. Bryce Mitchell absolutely mauled Edson Barboza and got 30-25, 30-26, and 30-27 on the three scorecards. Um, there was a meme made about Habib and Nurmagomedov's fight with Edson Barboza. And mind you, Habib is probably a lot stronger than Bryce Mitchell. Um, most would consider him to be a better wrestler than Bryce Mitchell. He went four for 13 on his takedown attempts. That means he shot on 13 takedown attempts, missed nine of them, secured four of them. Bryce Mitchell went four for four, 100% on his takedowns against Edson Barboza, and he even knocked him down on the feet, <clears throat> which none of us saw coming. Bryce Mitchell is one of those guys, man. Like, he might be the best featherweight in the world. We don't like, I know there's still Alexander Volkanovsky, there's still Max Holloway, but dude, Bryce Mitchell is for real. He's now 15 and 0. He hasn't even had a close fight in the UFC since his debut against Tyler Diamond. He's just mauled everybody. And then, of course, we have Bryce's political views, which I have made a compilation of with my own piece at the end of it. I would really appreciate it if y'all check that out because everyone, and I do mean everyone in this entire fucking country, needs to hear it. Rafael Dos Anjos beat Hanato Moicano up for four rounds and then lost the fifth to our surprise because that fight shouldn't have even gone past round three or four. It should have been stopped. Hanato was getting smashed. He took that fight on like four or five days notice and went five rounds with a former champion. Now, Dos Anjos, there's something to be said about this because he's turning 38 years old later this year in October, and he hadn't had a fight or win in a year and a half going into this fight. So when you haven't fought in that long <clears throat> and you're nearing 38 years old, I wondered what kind of a performance he was going to have. And, dude, it was dominant, man. He is still as good as he's ever been, or so that performance showed. And that was really cool to see. That was really cool to see. The same could be said for Jorge Masvidal also turning 38 years old later this year. And Colby Covington absolutely just fucking mauled him the whole time. Now, he did get caught in the fourth round, but Masvidal wasn't able to really capitalize on it. And Colby is just as dominant as ever. And I was so happy to see it because I love Colby. Um, you know, Dos Anjos and Masvidal would be a good fight, come to think of it. They have similar records. They're both turning 38 years old in the fall of this year. They both fought at lightweight and waterweight. They both fought for titles. They're both technically champions. Masvidal is a BMF champion. Dos Anjos is an actual champion. But what's next for Colby Covington? I think that him calling out Dustin Poirier is really cool because that would be such a great fight to see, even though Poirier is a lightweight. Um... Colby's a pretty tiny waterweight, and he's finally came out and admitted that. No, I always said it. And going into his second fight with Usman, I was like, wow, Colby has actually gotten a little bit bigger, but he's still not a big waterweight. Like, he could make 155, but he chooses not to. Um, and Dustin Poirier is a really, really thick lightweight that hits hard as fuck. Now, that being said, I think Colby would just maul him, but it would be a good win for him. Um, a lot of people wanted to see Poirier and Nate Diaz, but... Think about it. They could give Nate Diaz Tony Ferguson. They could give him Vicente Luque. And then they could make Jorge Masvidal versus Conor McGregor. How about that? There you go. Three matchups made for you guys. Who knows if they'll happen. But all right. <clears throat> UFC Vegas 50. Now, Guido Canetti, actually, no. Asma Merkzakhanov beat Tafan Njekwi. And I was so upset about this because I love Tafan Njekwi. He's such a great kickboxer. He's 12-1 and one in professional Muay Thai. And he's done really well in the UFC so far. He won his debut against Jamie Pickett when he was only 4-0. Oh. Um, all of his wins prior to that were knockouts. He went to the distance the first time. Then he lost to Jung Young Park, who's done pretty well for himself lately. Um, he then beat Mike Rodriguez before, man, he was winning this fight. He's picking Merzikhanov apart, man. And the first round was pretty – was close, but the second round, he was just walking away with it. Like, man, he looks so great. And then early in the third round, he gets caught with a flying knee. 
and starched with it. And man, that sucks because Mirza Kalinov was 10 and 0 coming into the fight. I think seven or eight of his wins were knockouts. He's a knockout artist too. It was a fight between two great strikers. I really was upset to see it go the way it did. I got such high hopes for Tathan, and he's so fun to watch fight. Guido Canetti finished off Chris Motino very early, and I think that was a surprise to a lot of people. It wasn't quite as much of a surprise to me. Um, no, I thought it was stopped just a little bit early, but I can see why it was stopped. Then his eyes were gone. Um, if it wasn't stopped, I think he probably just would have ate another shot and, you know, ended up going down and then it would have gotten stopped. So I'm not going to complain about it. He was hurt really fucking badly. And Guido Canetti, dude, he doesn't have a good record and he gets finished in just about all of his losses. But, dude, he's a good fighter, man. I've said this for a while. He's a really good fighter, especially for 41, 42 years old. It's pretty remarkable. And as a bantamweight at that age, like name another bantamweight that had that that's had success at that age. Joe Warren. So that's probably about it. Um, but yeah, Mutino, he took a lot of damage against Sean O'Malley, guys. And that was like half a year ago, less than half a year ago. Um, yeah, you can't take damage like that and accept fights too soon after. Cody Brundage submitted Dolce Lungi and Bula pretty early. Um, 53 minutes, 41 seconds into the first round. That was pretty impressive. Miranda Maverick is back on the win track with a submission victory over Sabina Mazzo, which was great. I just, I love Miranda Maverick. She is fucking awesome in, like, every way, shape, and form. Um, Damon Jackson, again, back on the win in track. He's now on a two-fight win streak with a second-round submission over Camilo Kirk. That was really good to see. Um, Kirk beat Maquan Amir Khani. I was really upset about that because I love Maquan. It was super cool to see someone like Damon Jackson submit him. No, I'd like to see Damon Jackson uh, fight Mac one Amir Khani, honestly, because they're almost the same fighter. On the feet, they're different. You know, Jackson is more of like a weird karate kind of fighter. I don't know. It's kind of hard to explain. You'd have to watch him fight. And Amir Khani is more of a boxer on the feet, but they're both really good wrestlers, and they both have wicked submissions. I would love to see that fight. And neither of them are ranked, so it would make a lot of sense. Um. Matt Sommelsberger gets his first non-knockout victory in the UFC as he beats AJ Fletcher by unanimous decision. Alex Perheya and Bruno Silva, this was a good fight. So it's not the fight a lot of us thought it would be, but Perheya came in with a four and one record, four knockouts and one submission loss. Four knockout wins, one submission loss. Silva came in 22 and six with 19 knockout wins and five submission losses in, of those six defeats. He had three decision wins, 19-3. Those were his 22 wins. Five losses or decisions, or submissions, I'm sorry. And the other loss is a disqualification. So the only time these guys have ever lost was on the ground. Every single one of their wins came from striking. For Heya, um, 30-27 them on all three cards, showing off some beautiful striking. It was a really, it was a good fight between two really, really dangerous guys. Silva went 3-0 in the UFC with three knockouts last year in 2021. Um, before that, he hadn't fought in like three years. So he made his return last year and went 3-0 with three knockouts in the UFC. It's like really astounding. I can't wait to see what's next for either of them. Perhe is calling out guys like um, Cannoneer and Vittori and Whitaker and Israel. And it's early in his career still, but man, could you imagine him fighting Israel again in MMA? That would be crazy. Drew Dober and Terrence McKinney. Man, I can't believe there was no fight of the night awarded at UFC Vegas 50 because Jesus Christ, man. This fight only went three minutes and 17 seconds into the first round. But, dude, Terrence McKinney, we saw why he has so many, and I mean so many, early finishes, okay? Like, he's got a finish. I'm going to go through all of his finishes, okay? 215 into the first round. 123 into the first round, 139 into the first round, 43 seconds into the third round, um, seven seconds into the first round, 257 into the first, 43 seconds into the first, 16 seconds into the first, 17 seconds into the first, 72 seconds into the first, seven seconds into the first, 211 into the first. Those are all of his finishes. So he's 12 and three, 11 of those wins are first round finishes which is just astounding. And he almost got another one. And Drew Dober, I'm pretty sure he's never been knocked out before. Let's see. He's got one knockout loss. What is it? 
Okay, so he has. He's been he has been starched one time, and that was in his ninth pro fight. Aside from that, dude, he is durable as fuck, and he showed that on Saturday by taking. He got dropped like three or four times, and came back and got the TKO victory before the th the first round was up. And man, if you didn't see that fight, fucking go back and watch it. It was wicked. Khalil Rontree and Carl Robertson. This was a good fight too. Carl Robertson, pro kickboxer. Um, Khalil Rontree trains with Tiger Muay Thai. So we knew this was going to be a good striking fight between two good strikers, two good kickboxers. Now, Rontree won the first round. He just controlled the action. Um, he dropped Robertson toward the end of the first. Um, he was the much bigger party of the two, we could tell. I mean, Robertson is more of a middleweight, I think. But even though Robertson is 9-5 and five and he's lost his last three fights, okay, he almost knocked out Glover Teixeira. He came so close. That, like, honestly, that fight could have been stopped before Teixeira rebounded and arm triangled him. Like, that fight could have been stopped. He could have a KO win over Glover Teixeira right now. But the fight wasn't stopped. And, you know, considering he's on a three-fight losing streak now, and Ron Tree is now on a two-fight winning streak, which is very exciting to see. And that second round, again, if you didn't see it, go back. That is one of the most violent, brutal showcases I've seen in this sport, and I've been watching the sport half of my life. I'm 25 years old. Actually, I've been watching a little more than half my life at this point. That he was just, dude, he came out with furious intentions and just fucked him up and got the stoppage 25 seconds into the second round. Sadiq Yusuf showed off a new part of his game against Alex Caceres. Now, most of us look at him like a striker because he's a heavy handed boxer, but Caceres is very hard to get a hit on because he's always moving so he tied him up in the first round and tried to wear on him along the fence a little bit in the second round he really started to get that inside leg kick going something we didn't really know was his in in his arsenal but that's really all Caceres was giving him at that point so he was really starting to pick him apart with that inside leg kick in the second round and it was great to see and then in the third round we got to see a little more grappling and most of us forget Sadiq Yusuf trains with Lloyd Irvin he trains with a lot of stud black belts in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Like, he's a good grappler. He can he actually considers himself a grappler over a striker. And he got back on the winning track after being defeated by Arnold Allen last year. Beats Alex Caceres, who came into the fight on a five-fight win streak. And has been defeating a lot of up-and-comers lately, such as Sadiq. But not this time. It's a good win for Sadiq. Can't wait to see what's next for him. Song Yidong and Marlon Marais. Man, <clears throat> this fight was crazy. No, I think a lot of us expected it to go this way. But Marais is still just as good of a fighter as he ever was. He just doesn't have a chin anymore. And I don't think his mentality is quite the same. Like, he still has all those skills. He's still made one of the most dangerous bantamweights in the world. But when he gets hit now, it's different. And I want to go over his record a little bit. Because, dude, going into his fight with Henry Cejudo, most, most of us picked him to win. And after that first round... I can't imagine what the live odds were. Like, that was one of the most dominant first rounds ever. Like, Cejudo's legs were fucked. They were fucked. Like, both of them, especially his lead leg. And then he switched stance, got that leg chewed up. Like, there's, there's no way Henry Cejudo was about to beat him. And then, dude, Cejudo just comes on, like, toward the middle end of the second round after losing a round and a half, and then gets a stoppage late in the third round. Marlon has not been the same fighter since then. He literally got beat the fuck down in that fight. Since then, he beat Jose Aldo by a split decision, a fight most of us think Aldo won. Neither of them did a lot, though. I mean, you really can't complain about it. I thought Aldo won, but it's like neither of them did much. So, And then since then, he's gotten knocked out four times in a row by Corey Sanhagen, Rob Font, Marab Devalishvili, and Song Yidong. Now, something you might notice, all four of those fighters are very good fighters, and three of them are knockout artists. But Devalishvili, that was his first finish inside the octagon. And he did it just the way Henry Cejudo did. Marias is now 23-10-1. And, and he took his gloves off after the fight in the cage. So this may be the end for him. He had such a wicked run. Six-time World Series of Fighting Bantamweight champion. Thank you so much, Marlon, for your career. Seriously, it was so fun to watch. And Song Yidong is still only 24 years old. Can you guess when he's turning 25? In December. Like, he's still so young, and he's, man, he's so good. He's now 19-5-1. He's now on a three-fight win streak. 
you know, he started off his UFC career 4-0 with three finishes. And then he had a draw with Cody Stammen, a fight we all know he lost. He beat Marlon Vera by unanimous decision, a fight we all know he lost. And then he lost to Kyler Phillips. So he went 1-1-1 one, one, and one when he probably should have went 0-3 in that stretch. But he has since gotten three good wins, including a knockout over Julio Arce and no Marlon Marais at 20, not even 24 and a half years old. Like, I can't wait to see what's next for him, man. He's so, 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 so talented. He's so quick. He hits so damn hard, kicks hard. Like, he's a problem. Then Tiago Santos and Magomed Inc. Live. No, I think this fight went the way a lot of us thought it would. I, for one, think Magomed Ankolaev is the best light heavyweight in the world. I really do. I think he's the best light heavyweight in the world right now. The only person that I would, could see beating him is maybe Yuri Prohaska because of how crazy he is. But then again, I could see Yuri losing to some guys that are in the lower half of the top 15 just because of the way he fights. Like, he fucking puts his chin out there. He's got a good chin, but he puts it out there. And he puts himself in harm's way, and it usually works out for him. But nonetheless, I believe <clears throat> Ankle I have to be the best light heavyweight in the world. Because he's now 17-1. and one. His only loss is to Paul Craig in a fight he was absolutely dominating. He got submitted at 459 of round three. Okay, there was one second left in that fight, and he tapped. Had he not tapped, he would have won the fight. Because, you know, like, he would have... He would have still been conscious. It was literally half a second later the buzzer sounded after he tapped. And he won more than 14 minutes and 50 seconds of that fight. He absolutely mauled Paul Craig. And that's not a bad lone defeat to have. Craig is like 4-0-1 in his last five. He's doing really well. Only guy to beat Jamal Hill. And also the only guy to beat Magomed Ankolaev. So, yeah, Ankoliyev is just, he's so technical. His shot selection is so beautiful. He can wrestle as good as anybody in the division. I don't see anyone all striking him. He did get hurt in this fight, but Tiago Santos hurts everybody that he touches. Um, and he has done that at middleweight and light heavyweight. So, I really can't wait to see what's next for Ankoliyev. This isn't the type of fight that's really going to push him up the rankings because he didn't, you know, take many chances. But, dude, after getting caught in that second round like that, would you? Probably not. He still won all three of the following rounds. So, yeah, that's a, that's a recap of the last two weeks. What did you guys think of the fights? Check out my next video, one well, of my next two videos, um, about Bryce Mitchell and his views. And also UFC Fight Night 204, which is headlined by Alexander Volkov, former world champion in M1 Global and Bellator, fighting Tom Aspinall, who's one of the brighter prospects in the sport today. Yeah, let me know what you guys think of those ones. I appreciate you for watching. Thank y'all. Have a good one.